When we left off on Wednesday, we were talking about general strategies uh, uh, for arrow pushing mechanisms. Uh, when you're not quite sure how to start, what are some general strategies that you can apply, whether, whether you know how to start or whether you're not quite sure how to start? And we've been talking about some basic ideas, um, <clears throat> like atom mapping, drawing the reactants or the intermediates in the same shape or orientation as the products, or vice versa, just to keep yourself oriented, making tables of bonds broken and bonds formed. These are powerful strategies. As you're going through a mechanism to make sure you're on track, breaking the bonds you need to break, forming the bonds you need to form. When we left off, I, I made the point that when you look at the reactants in a typical reaction mechanism, you know, typically these, the reagents that you're pouring into your reaction mixture were stored at room temperature. And if you can store your starting materials at room temperature, whether you synthesize the starting material yourself or whether it's a commercial reagent that you bought in a bottle, if they've been sitting in a bottle at room temperature for the past three weeks or three months or three years, they probably don't just react on their own. So if your reactions are proceeding at room temperature, your first step is probably not going to involve a reactant just simply doing something with itself. That's not plausible. Maybe if you're heating the reaction, then it can start to do something. Right? Heat this at 400 degrees, and maybe you'll start to see some weird things happening, but not at room temperature. So uh, typically, for reactions that are going at room temperature, you should try to find the most reactive species in there. In this case, I suggested it might be this iodine with the long bond and get that to react with something else. It doesn't just react with itself because it's been sitting in a bottle, even though it, it might be the most reactive species in there. Now, if you go back and you read the research paper where they talked about this, they don't give a complete mechanism for what's going on here, but they do suggest that the reaction involves some sort of a species formation of an oxygen silicon bond to generate a species like this, followed by some sort of a reaction. And they don't say the sequence of events, um, in this reaction. They just simply tell you that HI is going to be formed. It's going to do something with that double bond, and somehow or another you're going to end up with a new bond here between the oxygen. You'll end up with a new bond to H, and you'll end up with a new bond to oxygen, and they don't tell you the sequence of events there. Um, and so hopefully you'd be able to intersect with that intermediate by drawing an arrow pushing mechanism, uh, but they, they, they tell you these, these, uh, these are parts of a reactive intermediate in their proposed mechanism for the reaction. Okay, so again, reactants that have been isolated and purified and stored at room temperature probably don't just react on their own at room temperature because they were stored at room temperature. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think I've made this point pretty clear because when we started off in this class, we said frontier molecular orbitals give you a powerful way of thinking about relative reactivities. We said generally lone pairs, if all things are equal, lone pairs are more reactive than double bonds, and double bonds are more reactive than, than sigma bonds. Now you can change a sigma bond by making it a carbon-lithium bond, but if you just have carbon-carbon bonds versus carbon lone pairs versus carbon pi bonds, you know, the, the lone pair should be the most reactive part. So you should try to start your first arrow with a lone pair. If there's a lone pair in your reaction mixture, it's usually not implausible. It's usually plausible. Even if it doesn't lead to the product, it's usually plausible. So when I see this species right here, I really want to generate aromaticity. This is like the, uh, a step in electrophilic aromatic substitution of friedel crafts reaction. You've seen it before. And the pro the, you know, we want to generate aromaticity, but the question is, where do I start my first arrow? Everything I know about this tells me, don't start with the charge. Charges don't form bonds. Electrons form bonds. It's either going to be a lone pair or a bond that you're going to start with. And so let me draw the lone pairs here. Because the last thing in the world I want to do right here, the last thing I want to do is take my charge and attack there. The last thing I want to do is take my charge and attack the proton. The last thing I want to do is take a bond. The, one, the least reactive part of the system is a bond. The last thing I want to do is take that and attack the, the proton. What I want to do is draw the lone pairs, and there are lots of lone pairs on these chlorine atoms, on these chloride substituents. That negative charge on the illuminate makes that, these chlorines more reactive. And so it makes total sense that my first arrow would start with a chlorine lone pair and deprotonate and then push those electrons to regenerate aromaticity. 
I mean, this is the correct final step for electrophilic aromatic substitution when you do a friedel crafts alkylation or acylation reaction. And notice that the byproduct that you get here might freak you out when you're first taking a, a sophomore or an introductory organic chemistry class, but this is a total, totally typical species. You should be used to seeing things that look like this now. And this is exactly what you would get if you mixed HCl with aluminum trichloride, which is a powerful Lewis acid. You couldn't stop HCl, so this is the byproduct of a friedel crafts reaction. Start with your lone pairs. That's, it, um, that's usually a plausible type of arrow pushing step. Let's walk down here and look at this reaction of a Lewis acid, BF3 down here. You're adding boron trifluoride to this. Boy, I want to attack that Lewis acid with a lone pair. Isn't that what we do in this class with, lone we, with Lewis acids? We, and it's usually an oxygen lone pair. I don't see any nitrogen lone pairs. That might be more reactive, but I see oxygen lone pairs everywhere. And I didn't draw out all these ester groups here. If I did, if I did draw all the ester groups, I'd have lots of lone pairs I could choose from. And you wouldn't be crazy, you know, you don't know which lone pair is going to be the most reactive. It's not crazy to use this lone pair. It's not crazy to use, well, I, I wouldn't use the lone pair attached to the carbonyl. I'd use the carbonyl lone pair, right? There's lots of lone pairs to start from. Um, so if you start pushing with one of these other lone pairs, that, that's not crazy. But really, this reaction won't lead into a productive uh, direction until we uh, coordinate the Lewis acid to the carbonyl lone pair. We've had lots of mechanisms this quarter where we start uh, with ester carbonyls or ketone carbonyls or aldehyde carbonyls or amide carbonyls. The lone pairs on those carbonyls uh, can coordinate to Lewis acids. So when you do that, you'll end up with this, this, this kind of um, illid type species with B minus and O plus. Um, and that makes this acetate a better leaving group. So this acetate becomes a better leaving group. And remember that lone pair that maybe we were thinking about using before? That lone pair? You know, that could have coordinated to the BF3, right? But you wouldn't go, go anywhere productive with that, right? If we're trying to make, if we're trying to make this final product over here. Right? If you're trying to make this, coordinating to this lone pair with the Lewis acid won't take you anywhere. But now is a great time to use that lone pair. It makes sense to start our arrows with lone pairs. And I'm going to use these electrons and push out the leaving group. Now there's lots of representations I could choose. I could give the electrons here to the oxygen, or I could push those electrons all the way into the carbonyl, and then it doesn't matter. That would just give me a resonance structure. But the BF3 makes that a better leaving group. And so how do I finish up this mechanism? Well, I'm going to start with a lone pair, right? Which lone pair is most reactive? I'm going to start with the one on this O minus. Kind of makes sense, right? <laughs> and I can see in my product that there is no H atom over here on this carbon. So I have to remove that H if I want to get, at some point, I've got to remove that H. This seems like a pretty good time to remove that proton. Start with our lone pairs. They just seem to be involved in most steps you know, most of the time, your arrow, the first arrow, whether you got three arrows in that step or two arrows in that step or one arrow, most of the time, your arrows will start with a lone pair. And, and sometimes there's an alternative resonance representation where you could start with a pi bond, uh, but usually um, lone pairs are, are a good way to, uh, to keep yourself on track. So the, the issue is that usually when you draw structures in ChemDraw or draw structures in your paper, you don't necessarily draw all the lone pairs. I remember when I, when I took introductory organic chemistry as a sophomore, I drew every single lone pair on every heteroatom. Can you imagine how long that took me? But you know what? I, I didn't make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> the lone pairs were right there for me to see. And so I kind of, it kind of forced me to use them. I, I, maybe I just got lucky because I was being anal about it. But uh, um, you don't have to draw every single lone pair on every single heteroatom. But, um, sure does make it easy to guess where you should start if they're drawn for you. Okay, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I find is people are afraid to write an arrow, right? If they're not sure what to do, they're afraid to write an equal sign when they're doing math. They're afraid to draw a curved arrow when they're drawing, like, what if I'm wrong? Oh my God, the world will end if I draw the wrong... No, it won't. <laughs> the world won't end if you draw the wrong thing. And really, what is wrong and what is right is kind of a subjective issue. Let's go ahead and take the first step in electrophilic aromatic substitution, right? 
we've had lots of reactions of, of Lewis acids where the Lewis acid coordinates to carbonyls. And, and we've talked about how much aluminum loves oxygen. So it makes total sense to me to take this lone pair and coordinate that to the aluminum. Boy, I really want to do that. We've done that over and over again. Let me do this in high contrast black here. Haven't we coordinated carbonyl groups to Lewis acids in this class over and over again? Feels like we have. There we go. Look, I get this aluminate. I get that oxonium ion. You know what? Unfortunately, you are never going to get to the right product walking down this pathway. Everything I know told me to use that oxygen lone pair to coordinate to the aluminum. But that's not the productive pathway because we got to get the chloride off. And the last thing I want to do right now is remove the chloride and put another positive charge right next to that oxonium, right? That's, that would be insane. So we're stuck. You know what? You weren't crazy if you drew that out because that's happening in the reaction mixture. And it has nothing to do except go back until you get back to starting materials. Yes, that's happening. Yes, it's reversible. You weren't silly to draw that out. You were smart to draw that out. Just be ready to go backwards if you hit a dead end. Sometimes that happens all the time, especially in proton transfers, because proton transfers are fast and in equilibrium. Sometimes you're protonating all five oxygens or six oxygens of glucose, and you don't know which one is going to lead down the productive reaction pathway. OK, so where does this really start? So it's not crazy to coordinate to oxygen. That's happening in the reaction. But there's other lone pairs in this reaction mixture, like these. Let me do this in a different color, because I don't want to mix my arrows here, right? So if you, when you really want to start to draw out the mechanism, let's consider another lone pair. And this is the one that leads down the productive reaction pathway. So we were not crazy to draw the oxygen lone pairs coordinating to that Lewis acid. That, that made total sense. That was a smart move. But it's not until we get to here um, that, we're really, um, that we're really going down the productive reaction pathway. And that's what leads to the acylium ion in, a, uh, in an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. Um, in a friedel crafts acylation reaction. So don't freak out. If you hit a dead end, just back up, right? Just back up. It's, it happens all the time. It happens to me. I can't sit down and look at the starting materials and know absolutely what's the one single exact pathway, right? So you, you start to follow many plausible pathways until things start to match your bonds broken and bonds form table. Um, and you'll realize that pretty quickly. All right, so don't be afraid to push arrows, you know, with the expectation that it might not lead down the correct pathway, because that's the only way I know um, to, to get to the final products. All right, those are our, our basic strategies. Oh, wait, we got one more, one more basic tip that is actually a pretty important one. Um, you know, sometimes you'll be confronted with, uh, maybe this is a, a relatively simple reaction. So here you've got this enol silyl ether here as a starting material. And then they're adding methylithium. Well, what's the methylithium doing here? OK, that's a base. It's a nucleophile. You don't know exactly what's going on here, necessarily. There's protons over here on the starting material. You could pull protons off of here, maybe an allylic proton off of there. right? Sometimes it's easier to work backwards than forwards. Right? When I look at the product here, it's like, oh, wait, there's a carbon-carbon bond there. Well. That kind of looks like an enolate alkylation to me. Probably, right? You may not have known what the first step is, but if you've seen a lot of enolate alkylations, a lot of enolates attacking things, then you might have guessed that this might be the last step of the reaction mixture. You're adding some sort of a propargilic bromide, and so maybe the last step of the reaction might look like an SN2. That looks pretty plausible to me. Sometimes working backwards from the product, maybe the last step is the easiest one to guess. And so all we have to do is figure out, how do we get to an enolate from the starting material? Well, I'm clearly going to have to break the oxygen-silicon bond, right? There's no way to have an oxygen with no silicon unless I break the oxygen-silicon bond. And so maybe that's what, what the methylithium does. So let's go ahead and draw that out. Right, when we draw methylithium, it turns out that this is, uh, this is quite facile. You know, silicon can have more than four bonds to it. It's, silicon is not carbon. And so the first step of this, uh, of this pathway is that we're going to attack that silicon 
right? Deprotonating isn't going to help us because we don't need to pull any protons off of our starting material. No protons have been removed in the final product. So what we want to do is, but the silicon has been removed, so it makes sense to remove that silicon. So we'll, we'll add our alkalithium in there. Usually this is done with methylithium and not butylithium. And you get this siliconate, and that siliconate can easily release the, the enolate here. And you could pick up the lithium, or I'll just draw this as the free enolate here. Um, and in order to get to this next resonance structure, I'm going to push the electrons all the way down to here. But you could just leave the electrons on the oxygen if you want. It's the same idea. Okay, so now I've kind of intercepted that intermediate. It just seems like it was easier to work backwards. I may not have known what the methyl lithium was going to do in the first step, but I could make a pretty good guess what was going to happen in the last step. So sometimes be, it, you might find it easier to, to go to the final product and work backwards. Um, than, than starting at the very beginning if you're, if you're really having questions about that first step. All right, so those are powerful basic strategies. Now that you guys know a lot of elementary polar arrow pushing steps, uh, you can combine that with some, some strategic thinking in order to try to get some plausible pathways. And again, I don't ask you what is the single right arrow pushing mechanism. I ask you for a plausible arrow pushing mechanism. Sometimes there are more than one uh, plausible ways to draw things out.